we are also very glad that Philip Dibbig, that you are here with us today. So take it away, Philip. So thank you so much, John, and the prize committee and everybody else involved with this uh, uh, amazing uh, week in, in Stockholm. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the second paper Doug talked about because that's seems like it's working. Uh, the uh, the second paper Doug mentioned is my joint paper with Doug that was mentioned in, in the uh, prize description. Um, and I want to focus on um, multiple equilibria, which is one feature of the model. And it was a theme in my research before this paper. And I want to I give a call out to my co-authors on the prior research and talk about it. <clears throat> Having multiple equilibria, Doug mentioned that there's a there's an equilibrium with bank runs, and there's an e in our model, and there's an equilibrium uh, without bank runs, and um, there were you know there were actually sprinkled through the literature some descriptions of multiple equilibria, but I think at that time uh, multiple equilibria was was largely viewed as a defect in models that we had uh, a statement in the introductory macro course that says. Uh, uh, basically, they wanted to have you to have enough equations to determine the equilibrium. It says you don't if you don't have an equilibrium model, it's not a real. If you don't have a unique equilibrium, it's not a real economic model because you can't do prediction. And like a lot of uh, important sounding things, uh, you, these this doesn't bear looking into. But when you're a first year graduate student and and you need something to hold on to, a lot of people will just take take what you're given. Um, people had looked at multiple equilibria, people in game theory especially, had looked at things like coordination games where you'd have multiple equilibria. Um, and uh, in the Valrhasian model, we know that in general there are lots of competitive equilibria. But I think, again, these were viewed largely as defects. And uh, in our paper, I think it helped people to understand that having multiple equilibria can be the main point. It can be something that's important part of the economics that we should that we should be concerned about i have no conflicts to report i actually like it when the medical school people put this up here because it's important and i've seen uh papers by people who had big conflicts that they should have reported and and they didn't so i i'm getting in the habit of doing this um Doug mentioned uh our advisor steve ross i mean he's just the best advisor in the world just just uh, I've, I can't even imagine life without him. Okay, so this is a, a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to I'm going to talk about what is equilibrium, um, and uh, the price paper with Doug, which he's already covered uh, well. So it'll be a review, and prior papers with Chester Spat and Jerry James. I want to talk about. Uh, the sunspot model of uh, Dave Cass and Carl Schell. Um, sunspots is supposed to be an exogenous shock that's observable by everybody, but it's not economically relevant. Well, we know sunspots can disrupt communications and in principle in extreme cases could bring down the power grid, but that's not the idea. The idea is it's supposed to be something that's commonly observable, but but uh, gives us a source of uncertainty that we can use to coordinate on. And uh, then I want to talk about uh, a couple of ideas for where we could go next in the research. Okay, what is equilibrium? So uh, I think the intuition about equilibrium in, in economics comes from physics. And physics, if you have a ball on a surface, you're going to have an equilibrium where it's a local minimum. And, or at least flat. If it's a local minimum, then it's going to be a stable equilibrium. You move a little way, it's going to move back. If it's if it's if it's flat, but it's but you have a hill like this, then you move a little bit away, it's just going to keep going away. That that's an equilibrium, but you've got to sit right exactly there, and that would be an unstable equilibrium. 
So uh, a lot of things that early in economics, I think we're imitating things that we knew in physics and trying to use those ideas. Um, two popular types of equilibria that we still use as a definition now are competitive equilibrium and Nash equilibrium. Um, there are many, many other definitions of equilibrium we use in economics that are appropriate in different situations. But uh, these are the two I want to focus on and they're very, very classical. Uh, competitive equilibrium is for a world where agents intuitively are very small, they take prices as given, they look at the prices in the economy and they ask, how much do I want to demand at that price? And an equilibrium is a, is, is a point at which supply equals demand, or, if, or you could say excess demand of each of the agents adds up to zero. Um, so that's, that's a very common notion of equilibrium in economics. Uh, another notion, and that's what's going to be the focus here, Doug mentioned the word Nash equilibrium, which was named after the great mathematician, John Nash, who also won the economics prize, um, <coughs> is a choice for each agent that's optimal given the choices of other agents. So when we model a single agent, we, sit, we write down an optimization problem. We say, what is the objective function? The objective function could be to maximize uh, profit or, or the, the net value of profits over, over time, or it could be to maximize uh, utility. Utility is a way of representing preferences. So we assume in economics that, that they often assume that agents act as if they're maximizing this utility function. And we write down that utility function. Um, that's for a single agent. You just write down an optimization problem. But what do you do when there are multiple agents and they're act interacting? And the way that we uh, uh, describe that is through some notion of equilibrium. Because we have to say, um, uh, well, what's optimal for me is going to depend on what the other agents do. And what am I going to assume about that? And in Nash equilibrium, the assumption is simple. It's, it's that I'm that, that everybody is making choices that are consistent uh, in the sense that what I assume that they're doing is what they're going to want to do if they assume the same thing about what I'm about what other people are doing and and they're assuming that I'm doing what I'm going to choose optimally. So that's that's a uh, notion of, of Nash equilibria. And when we say that there are multiple equilibria, it's just saying that there's more than one vector of prices or one more than one vector of choices that is is an equilibrium. So Doug already talked about our model. In our model, the, uh, you can have an equilibrium where everybody uh, takes their money out, whether or not they need it. We call that a run. Turns out not to be very good for anybody. And um, if you think everybody else is going to take out their money, then you realize that the bank is going to run out of money uh, before you get there if you wait. So you're going to take out all your money if you can as well. And alternatively, there's an equilibrium where uh, everybody uh, takes out their money only if they really need it. So um, uh, it could be that somebody down the street is selling a classic car, which I think is super cool, and I really want my money out now, and I'm going to take my money out to do this. Or it could be that I have some kind of health issue. It could be I have a friend who needs money. Uh, uh, it could be that I feel a sudden need to take a trip and get away from things. Whatever the reason that I want the money, it's a private reason that you can't necessarily demonstrate to the bank to document that you want the money. But um, uh, it's valuable for me to have the ability to take out my money if, if some opportunity comes up that is going to make me, uh, make me want the money. And so that, that's, um, that's uh, what uh, the feature of liquidity that Doug talked about. So here's a picture of Doug. His picture of us is much cooler. I'm, I'm jealous, but uh, I'm, I'm grateful too because I, I like seeing that picture. Um, uh, you, know, you know, I want to talk a little bit about Doug. He and I have you know, worked together a lot I can't remember ever having a real fight. 
we would have little arguments and the arguments, but the arguments were about, because we both wanted the, the research to be as good as possible, the paper to be as good as possible. So one of us would say, let's assume this. And the other one would say, no, we can't assume that. It'll be impossible to solve. Let's assume this other thing. And the first one will say, yeah, we can't solve that. It throws away all the economics. And we go back and forth. But never any unpleasantness. It was just like we, we both really wanted everything to work well. Just, just as... Uh, uh, superior co-author. Anyway, so back to the paper. So, so if you this this uh, idea that you may want your money out, and you may want to get it out early, and it's because of a private shock that that you can't document to the bank, is a notion that you like liquidity. And so, when you have something that looks like bank deposits, when you can get your money out whenever you want to that has liquidity and you value that because you might you don't really know as Doug put it how long you want your money in or as I'm putting it in and both are consistent with our model uh, an opportunity comes up where you where you, where you uh, really value using the money more than you normally do and so that's a, something that's valuable for the depositor for the customer uh, but bank assets are illiquid they pay a lot more if you leave them in. So let's say that you that the bank has made a loan to a shopping center and you have a half completed shopping center sitting there. Well, the money is in this half completed shopping center. You can't really sell a half completed shop shopping center, uh, not for very much. And so even if you write the contract with the borrower that says that you that uh, that the bank can take back their money if they can. Uh, they're not going to agree to giving back very much money in the middle because they're not going to have it. Um, so in our thinking, we thought bank assets were illiquid because of information asymmetry. Uh, because if somebody comes to you to sell bank assets, you've spent a lot of time researching the loans and you know a lot about what they're worth. You're going to try to sell the ones that are lemons. They're terrible. It's like Akerlov's, Akerlov uh, got the prize for the lemons model. It's exactly this kind of adverse selection. And that's why bank assets are illiquid. But in our model, we, we made a simpler assumption. We assumed the, li the illiquidity was in the technology, like in the uh, shopping center example. And the reason we did that is because that's not the most important part of the model. And it's going to serve our purpose. We worked really hard uh, to make the model as simple as possible. I think probably professional economists think it's simple. I don't know if others do. But uh, the, having a simple model is really beneficial because people have additional degrees of freedom that they can still handle. And people have added a lot of things to the model and they can still solve it. And so it's also a little bit like a crystal or a poem. We just want to have the, the simplest possible setting to to. Uh, uh, explain the internal consistency of the economic ideas we we're talking about. Okay, so bank assets are illiquid, which means that you don't get much back if you liquidate them in the middle. Uh, demand deposits are liquid, and there's this mis mismatch. Now, um, we assume the bank assets are riskless. That's a feature, not a bug. Uh, some people say, I can't believe Diamond and Divig assume bank assets are, risk are riskless. You know, we know they're risky. Well, uh, it's a feature because we're saying everybody knows that banks can fail if the assets are risky. That's obvious. What we're saying that is that even if the assets are risk riskless and if there's enough assets there to handle the bank if the good things happen then, and pay off all the depositors, then... Um, then there still can be problems. We can still have bank failures. And of course, if the assets are risky, it doesn't take away the observation. There's still bank failures. So um, uh, because of this, there, there are uh, multiple equilibria. There's a good equilibrium uh, when people withdraw only when the money is needed. There's a bad equilibrium in the bank run when, when everybody takes their money out, whether they need it or not. There's also another mixed strategy equilibrium in between where people randomize, but 
the economics of that are not really much different than the run equilibrium, so we need to talk about that. And then the other thing we talked about in our paper is what can you do in terms of policy. Uh, some ways you can prevent people from running on the bank is that you can, you can uh, have deposit insurance so that people are guaranteed to get their money out whether or not there's, uh, whether or not there's a run. Even if everybody runs in the, on the bank and the, and the assets are gone, uh, the government deposit insurance fund will pay them off. Um, that's, that's the thing that we think is probably most effective. Uh, in a setting where bank assets are risky, you also need for th there to be monitoring of the bank so they don't take too, too much risk. That's, that's outside of our model. Um, a second thing we talked about is a discount window, uh, like a discount window at the central bank where they give the money, lend banks money if they, if they have trouble meeting uh, the withdrawals. And as Doug said, that may suffer from a credibility problem. If people are unsure whether the, whether the central bank will always uh, fund, the, uh, fund the banks that are in trouble, then that's not going to be an effective uh, way of, um, of preventing runs. Then the third thing we talked about is the bank holidays. Uh, I, I found Ben's comments interesting because I, I actually didn't know anything good about bank holidays until I heard that comment. Uh, basically, you can just shut down the bank and not give anybody back their money, and that defeats the whole purpose of the, of the liquidity. Uh, it's interesting. I didn't realize that that was used as a reset uh, after the Great Depression and, and was actually something beneficial. But as a policy for, for preventing runs, it's not a good effective policy to say, don't worry if there's a run, we're going to shut down the bank because people are, people are going to just take their money out anyway. <laughs> so so uh, anyway, that's interesting. Uh, as Ben said, and, and with a lot more nuance, uh, several markets in the 2008 financial crisis look just like our bad equilibria. And both Ben and Doug uh, mentioned some other crises have this uh, feature too. Uh, so the repo market, which is a big shadow banking market, the money market mutual funds, some actual banks ran, uh, bank commercial paper, those are, those are some of the markets that look pretty much just like the bad equilibrium in our model. So Doug mentioned this paper in 86. Uh, I stand by most of the stuff in the paper. I think the description of money market funds is, is kind of accurate, but a little embarrassing. It says, says, you know, ignoring some uh, extreme times, you can think of the money market funds as being very safe because they have normally like liquid assets and liquid liabilities. Uh, but actually the uh, extraordinary times are, are the interesting times <laughs> and, and, they, and uh, the assets became illiquid um, uh, during, the, during the financial crisis. But anyway, about this quote, Basically, this quote talks about shadow bank. You could think of this as, as a discussion of the repo market. It says that if you keep restrict banks too much and keep them from doing their job, we focus on 100% reserve banking because that was the topic of the conference where we, where we, that this came out of. But basically, if you don't let banks do your job, then some other institutions can arise that can... Um, can, uh, would, will try to replace banks in their function, like the repo market and these other, other types of, of markets. But uh, it's risky because the bank liquidity may not be surplus liquidity, and it probably isn't. And uh, it also can reduce stability, instability because the new firms that move in uh, fill the vac to, to fill the vacuum left by banks uh, may have runs. And so we saw that in the financial crisis. The run on the repo market was a, a big part of the contraction of the economy. But anyway, I like, I like our policy piece. I think a lot of it stands up. Um, and as Doug says, it's kind of a shame we haven't written more papers, but that could still happen. Um, so I already, we already talked about the good equilibrium and the bad equilibrium. Uh, Doug talked about it, and I talked a little bit about it. But basically, if, if you don't need the money out, uh, 
you don't run in, in the uh, good equilibrium, but you do run anyway in the bad equilibrium. Take your money out. Okay, so I want to move on to talk about some of the joint papers that I did with, with uh, other co-authors that had multiple equilibria. Uh, this, this is a paper called Adoption Externalities of Public Good. It's with uh, Chester Spett. Chester was my good buddy in graduate school. He's a year ahead of me and, and showed me the ropes. Uh, so uh, in this paper, we have like adoption of a technology. Uh, for us, we thought about uh, telephones or something like a standard unit of measurement. And uh, if whether you want a phone or not depends on who else has a phone. Equilibrium in this looks a lot like, like the bank runs model. If everybody else has a phone, you probably want to pay the money to buy a phone because all your friends will have phones and you can talk to them. If, if, almost, if nobody else has a phone, you don't want a phone, you, you have to pay for it, but you don't get any benefits. And so this is very similar to bank runs models, it, is that everybody else, you'd like to do what everybody else is doing. And so uh, that was something that was, that was an influence on me in thinking about uh, the bank run paper. Second paper with Chester that had multiple equilibrium is about uh, consumer information and product quality. And uh, in this uh, story, you have a restaurant that's producing food and the qu higher quality is more expensive to produce. And uh, the question is the customers, how much will they pay? It depends on what quality they expect. And one equilibrium is always to offer the lowest possible quality. You expect junk and you get junk. And so you don't pay very much. Um, but it's also, there are also equilibria with where larger quality is, is offered. And how much larger it can be offered depends on uh, how good the consumer's information is. So uh, this paper was written before the, uh, before the internet. And so um, if you have a restaurant on the highway and it takes a long time for a typical person to return, or maybe they never uh, return, then people don't have very good information. And that's why you have an alternative way of certifying quality uh, for restaurants on the highway. They tended to be chain restaurants. So that's a different mechanism. Um, but this is a case where the important question is about multiple equilibria. Um, this was never published. We were silly young people. This was actually accepted at the RE stud and they wanted to take out a little section that we thought was really important. And so we said, no, we're going elsewhere. And we should have just said, can't we leave it in? Please, we'll take out something else. Or we should have consulted a senior colleague. So anyhow, that's the way it goes. So the next two sets of, the next two papers are joint papers with uh, Jerry Janes. Uh, he was a professor. He was uh, my professor at Penn. And I think quite accidentally, he moved to Yale at the same time so I moved to Yale as a student with, with St my advisor, Steve Ross. And um, these are both labor papers that have very similar assumptions. Um, you have that, that firms have to pay not only the wages that they pay to the workers, but they also have to pay training costs. And the training costs are, um, are firm specific in our paper, but it would be the problem would be even worse if you had general training costs that could be transferred. So the thing that's, the th the thing that's going on is that uh, you can get an unemployment in this model, very similar to what Keynes described, uh, because um, if you uh, have uh, some unemployment, so there are people who are working, willing to work at less than the, at the prevailing wage, and uh, you have a bunch of firms that are offering the same wage that's higher than the competitive wage would be, you may not be able to enter and make a profit because when you enter, the uh, people in your firm are gonna have applications in at the firms that pay more and you're gonna incur a higher training cost than the other firms. So if the wage is not too much higher than the reservation wage that the workers have, then, uh, then you can have the unemployment in equilibrium. And um, this, is, this is a little similar to some things farmers done. 
Uh, Keynes says, you know, the postulates to the classical theory are applicable only to a special case, and, and it's a limiting point of the possible positions of equilibrium. That's consistent with our, our model. Uh, we never published this or other paper because we both moved in very different directions in our careers. And he, he uh, uh, you know, a couple years after this was on a commission studying the status of black people in, in, uh, in the United States. And I moved more into finance, but I think these are interesting papers. So I want to give a call out to, to Jerry. The other paper has very similar assumptions. The difference is we have multiple wages that are offered and you can have firms offering multiple wages. If, if my firm offers a higher wage than you, uh, uh, that costs me more, but I'll ha also have a lower quit rate. And there's features of the distribution that make you just indifferent. And so you can get wage dispersion. I uh, also want to give a car shout out to Carl Schell. Uh, Carl was one of my mentors, and he has his paper with, uh, with Dave Cass. So in the bank runs model, one, one thing we thought about a little bit is, you know, well, why would you ever, if, if you're going to have the run equilibrium, why would you put your money in? You know there's going to be a run equilibrium, you don't do that. Well, the answer is in the sunspots model. So sunspots model says if you have multiple equilibria and you have some randomness that you observe, that everybody observes, you can select the equilibrium based on that. So it could be that you only have, uh, you know, 1% of the time when the sunspots are really big or really small, whatever they are, uh, when you have the bank run equilibrium, then it may still pay to put your money into the bank. So um, uh, that's a useful note. I also want to mention that, that uh, that uh, Carl has written lots of interesting papers with, with uh, himself and with his students, and his students have also written lots of interesting papers extending our paper. So it's part of the reason that people are so familiar with our paper. I want to mention a couple ideas for further work. Manju Puri has, has looked at actual bank runs, and at least to, to my mind, uh, uh, and with, some, with a bunch of co-authors. At least to my mind, uh, the simple equilibrium in our model or the continuous or the multi-period models I've seen don't look so much like the, the equilibrium in that model. I think there's some opportunities to do that. Um, I, don't think, I don't think that invalidates our model as something that's useful for, for stability, but I also think it would be interesting to get better fit with the empirics. Uh, David Pierce has a concept of rationalizability. He was a student when I, when I was teaching at Princeton. Uh, Bernheim also has another concept. Uh, one of the things about Nash equilibrium is a little unsatisfying is that how do people know what Nash equilibrium everybody else is thinking about? And rationalizability says, well, all I can impose is really that everybody in the economy has some reasonable idea that's consistent with the reasonable ideas that other people could have. And that'll give you a larger set of equilibrium and maybe could help us to fit, for example, the empirical uh, results of Manchu. Uh, here's some other mentors. Uh, Mike McGill was an undergraduate professor who, who, whose uh, graduate economics course I took without any prerequisites. But since it was half of it was Hamiltonians and physics stuff, and I was a physics major, it worked out. Uh, he also helped me to, to figure out graduate schools. And these others are all, all uh, mentors from uh, graduate school, all, all very helpful in my career. So anyway, it's been a lot of fun uh, thinking about the prize paper and some of the roots that, in terms of thinking about multiple equilibria in some of my earlier papers. And, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank, you know, my, my uh, 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 colleagues, co-authors, mentors. It's, uh, it's really great that I've been able to interact with you. Douglas, please. Thank you so very much, Philip. And I think there are some people who want to take photos. So if you, all three of you can stand here. <laughs> uh, 
And we take the opportunity to give them a big applause again.